Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 44. So this week I'm going to be tackling the arc The Ashes of Jeddah. They are in the main run of Star Wars comics, issues 38 to 43, and they specifically are basically a sequel to Rogue One. Now, Rogue One is one of the best Star Wars films, I'd say, and it's definitely one of the best newest ones, and this comic arc is, I'd probably say, one of the best of the arcs within the main run of Star Wars comics. I don't think it's it quite hits the nail on the head quite as hard as a lot of the Darth Vader comics do, but few comics in my eyes do that. But as far as all the other Star Wars comics go, this is a really, really cool arc. So a little bit of information before we get started. So the writer for this is Kieran Gillen, who also has written the first run of the Darth Vader comics, all of which I've tackled on this very show. He also wrote the first 19 issues of the Doctor Afro comics, which I'm currently tackling on the show. I haven't quite got to number 19 yet, I don't think. Um, so Kieran Gillen, he's a great uh, writer and he's done a lot of work I really enjoy. The artist is Salvador La Roca and the colorist is Guru EFX. Now, as I said, issue 38 is the first of this arc that was released in November 2017. Issue 43 was the last of this arc that was released in February 2018. And the trade paperback collection of all of these was released in April 2018. And for clarity, this is set around a year after Rogue One. It's not exactly clear because obviously Star Wars don't like to pin things down to the day and where each planet has its own amount of rotations and hours in the day and all that sort of other jazz. It gets a little bit complicated. So as I said, it's not exactly clear. We think it's slightly before a full year since the Battle of Yavin and Rogue One happened a week maybe before the events of A New Hope. It the whole film is kind of hard to sort of pin down. But yeah, in my own head, this is basically set about a year after Rogue One. And for clarity, I will be posting pictures of the covers of all these and also one photo from each of the comics themselves. I'll be putting that on Instagram and on Facebook on either Saturday or Sunday when this gets released. So it'll be the weekend of the 13th slash 14th of February. And also as a little fun thing, uh, I started a Patreon recently. I'm going to go into more detail of that right at the very end. Uh, but I started a Patreon for my other podcast, Genuine Chit Chat. And on there, I, as of recording this, which is Thursday the 11th, I've just posted all of those pictures that I mentioned. So if anyone does like genuine chit chat and also listens to styles comics in canon wants exclusive content and access to additional photos early and all these sorts of other things then go check it out on patreon otherwise you can just wait like the majority of other people and check it out on social media so with all that in mind let's get started so here's the crawl part one the ashes of Jeddah. it is a period of high tension in the galaxy Rebellion leaders Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker, joined by smugglers Han Solo and Sana Staros, are leading the mission to find a new base for their operation. Meanwhile, the Galactic Empire has returned to Jeddah in an attempt to collect the remaining kyber crystals that survived the Death Star's attack. So kicking off with everything here, as I want to clarify, this is six issues and there's quite a lot of story, quite a lot of stuff going on. I'm going to try as what I normally do is kind of give you general plot points, general narratives. There is a degree of spoilers, I guess. I mean, by the end, you will have known what happened in the arc, but I don't read out all the dialogue because that would take me forever. There are little bits and pieces I miss out specifically because I want you guys to read these comics because it's great for the creators who, um, you know, make the comics and things, help the industry, etc, etc. But I understand that not everyone everyone can afford or has the time to read every Star Wars comic. So I'm doing it for you guys. Well, every canon Marvel Star Wars comic that is at the moment anyway. We'll see where the year takes us. So also with this one, there's going to be a lot of little connections here and there because obviously it's connected to Rogue One. Uh, so let's get started with issue number 38. So it starts off on Jeddah. There's basically some people in a dust storm. We've got two partisans fighting the Empire when Luke shows up with a lightsaber and Leia appears as well. Now, for clarity, the Partisans are the name of basically the rebel cell that Saul Guerrero had. So, generally speaking, the Rebel Alliance is called the Rebel Alliance because there's different cells of rebellion. Uh, this is all detailed in the series Star Wars Rebels, and in that series as well, Saul Guerrero does make an appearance, and it's a really, really cool arc that he's in. And it's Rebels is set before Rogue One and A New Hope, so it's really interesting in that regard. But essentially... 
there's like, you know, for example, on Lothal, there's a cell of rebels, like a group of like six of them. And then when they eventually catch wind of the full rebel alliance, then the rebel alliance is just the connecting dots between all of the different cells of people who basically start their own little rebellion on their home worlds. And the alliance is connecting them all together, which is really cool. But as it's shown quite well in Rogue One, when they're all discussing whether or not to go to Scarif, all of the different sort of cells and aspects all have slightly different, maybe agendas, slightly different ideas and things like that. And Saul Guerrero is the most extreme that we know of. So his group of rebels are called the Partisans. And obviously this is set after Rogue One. I hope that everyone who's listening has seen Rogue One because it's an amazing movie. And, you know, this is the sequel comic. And obviously Saul Guerrero dies. So in Rogue One, Saul Guerrero for clarity is the character played by Forrest Whitaker. He's the one who's got like a breathing apparatus and is in that strange suit thing. And he's the one who, you know, is a friend of Jyn Erso's and helped her when she was younger. So his Partisans, some of them survived after Jedha got shot at. Well, by the Death Star, but obviously they only blew up Jeddah City rather than, you know, destroying the entire planet. And so the partisans are who's left, essentially. So anyway, as I said, Luke and Leia appear to basically help these two partisans who are fighting the Empire in a dust storm. They're on these things called Spammels. Now, Spammels do actually show up in Rogue One. I didn't spot them, uh, but they are there. And they're basically just camels. Uh, they're Star Wars camels. A lot of creatures that you hear in Star Wars, they're basically just the name of something and they're slightly different. They're not quite camels as in the sense of they look like camels, but they are this general shape, the general size. They've got really long legs, quite big torsos and things, quite long necks and people ride them and stuff. So yeah, Spammel. And the Spammels are actually wearing masks as well because they needed to be able to breathe in this sort of dust storm and things. So Luke and Leia grab these two partisans and take them to Han Solo in the Falcon. They head to Nar Jeddah, um, which basically there's loads of large pink crystals about and the partisans have been there for weeks. Essentially, Nar Jeddah, or Nar Jeddah, is the planet itself. Jeddah is actually a small desert moon and it orbited the planet Nar Jeddah. And there's like an early Jedi temple in there. It's sacred land. And that's where a lot of kyber crystals are found, which is why the Empire went there in Rogue One, because the Death Star was powered by kyber crystals, which is the thing that powers the Jedi's lightsaber as well. So... And I want to clarify, they, there's a panel, or a page rather, where Luke looks up from Najeda at what Jeddah looks like now, as I said, around a year or so after it got hit by the Death Star. And the artwork itself is incredible. I've taken a photo of that specifically, and I will be posting it on social media. As I said, it's already on the Patreon. But it's a really, really cool show of what Jeddah actually looks like now. Uh, I won't necessarily spoil it, but a chunk of it is missing, um, and it looks it looks incredible in a good way to see his art, but horrendous to look at if it was an actual planet. So while they're looking up at this thing, uh, and Luke's looking up and thinking how horrendous it looks, because obviously he's not seen it before, there's a character called Chalco Gi, and he describes it as a maimed moon that is dying. He is an aspirant to the discipline of the wills. Now, for clarity, the wills is vaguely, it's kind of like the will of the force, in a sense. If you imagined the force like a god, the wills would almost be the beings and controlling tissue that kind of enforce God's will in, in in some ways, but it's a bit more complicated than that. And in the Clone Wars series six, the last arc is an arc about Yoda. And it's about him going on a journey. He finds Dagobah. He learns how to be a force ghost generally. And he speaks to these creatures or this creature. And they are very heavily connected to the wills. For clarity, wills, W-H-I-L-L-S. Now, in line with that, the Guardians of the Wills, which is Chirrut Imwe and Baze Malbus, they're the two guys in Rogue One. Chirrut Imwe, um, played by Donnie Yen, he's the one who's the blind monk, who is one of the best characters in Rogue One, and Baze is his friend with a giant gun. Now, they are Guardians of the Wills, and this guy, Chalco Gi, want to become a Discipline of the Wills. They're fairly similar in general. Basically, the Guardians of the Wills follow the will of the force and will act for it as well. Whereas the disciplines of the wills are less, they don't demonstrate things quite as much. They kind of just listen and understand the force and kind of feel it and things. And they do a lot of charity work. So I kind of view it in my interpretation as kind of disciplines of the wills are like pacifist monks in a sense, just kind of observing the will of the force and doing a lot of charity work. While guardians of the wills are kind of the step up and they're more so they will go out if things are going wrong they'll protect the weak they may fight people that sort of stuff they're a bit more combative so this guy um Chalkogi, he's the basically pacifist side of things so i hope i've kind of explained that a bit 
I'd say to, to fully understand the wills, you would probably have to read a fair amount of Star Wars books, see that episode of The Clone Wars with Yoda and things, and look it up as well. I had to look it up to fully understand. And as I said, they are quite vague with it, and I think that's important because the Force is very much about interpretation in Star Wars, especially if you read The Light of the Jedi book, which is excellent, and that's set in the High Republic era, 200 years before Phantom Menace. In that, there's a really, really cool part. It's like half a page and it's just each sentence is explaining kind of how each jedi sees the force so it's like a wookie jedi and he sees it about like a giant tree like a tree of life sort of thing there's another one who sees the force as like water and the ocean and things there's another one who sees it, i think as music and whatnot and like sounds so everyone kind of perceives their own interpretation of the force very differently even though they're all a part of the jedi order and i think that's quite important because the wills being like the will of the force is also down to interpretation and has loads of different sects within it of how they see it so yeah massive tangent there about the wills i hope it makes sense to you guys and i'm sorry if it doesn't I'm just going to read a quick exchange here between Chalco and Luke. I think it's quite interesting. Um, this is basically all just Chalco saying this and then right at the very end Luke says something. So, I am Chalco Gi. I am an aspirant to the disciplines of the wills. I was completing the sevenfold steps of my order. But to do so, I must meditate for a month in the sacred temple. The sacred temple was destroyed by the imperial blade. The planet is dying. The seas rebel. The force is sickened here. The world screams. The universe screams. But even this must be as the Force wills it. As bad as this is, I must have faith. This must be for a reason. And Luke says, yeah, I know what you mean. And I want to read that bit out specifically because I just think it's quite interesting, the parallels between Chalco Gi and Luke. You know, Luke's been thrown into this realm of the Force and Jedi and all these sorts of other things. And he's kind of just kind of tripping and falling his way through lessons and stuff, especially in the last arc of um, this. So, you know, it's quite like that. So um, I want to clarify that Cholco Gi was one of the partisans that was saved by Luke and Leia. The other one is someone called Ubin Des. Now Ubin Des, she was with the Alliance, and then during the Battle of Scarif, she was actually sick with something, like ill, um, had some sort of illness, so she couldn't actually go to the Battle of Scarif, and she feels like, you know, she missed out on something quite big there, and that's such a big important thing, and she views, you know, Jyn Erso as the sort of, the top end of rebellion, of someone who's willing to give their life for the cause. And after she kind of recovered from her illness and things, and after what happened to Scarif and to Jeddah, she came back home to Jeddah, which obviously is her homeworld. Leia and Ubin are talking and things, and they're talking about, you know, the partisans and the rebellion, etc. And they're talking about the Empire that are basically trying to enforce their will on Jeddah. And Ubin says that these are brutes. You haven't dealt with the Empire like this before. So that cuts on to the Imperials that they are talking about, which is Commander Kamchar and Queen Trios. And they arrive on a Star Destroyer. Now, Queen Trios, for any of you who've read a lot of Star Wars comics or have listened to this show quite a lot, will recognise the name Queen Trios because she appeared in the Darth Vader Annual Number 1, and she also appeared in the arc of the, or basically the third volume of Darth Vader comics of the first run, that is issues 16 to 19, and I tackled that on episode 23 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. And just briefly, Trios basically... On her planet, there was loads of minerals and things. It's the Shu Turen is the name of her planet and her people. The Shu Turen, they had loads of minerals and things. They're like a mining planet and whatnot. Uh, Vader goes there and kills all of her family, making her the queen, and gives her a chunk of order on and says to her, look, this will be your planet if you don't follow the Empire. We need this amount of resources. We need this, that, and the other. If that's a problem, I will be returning. And this is just after everything happened from A New Hope. So obviously, the Empire put loads of resources into the Death Star. The Death Star got blown up by Luke, and the Empire now need to go and find resources elsewhere to continue with being an Empire. And for clarity, Commander Kamchar, he is a hulking, brutish, bold gentleman. He has an eye patch and a cybernetic arm, and he is pretty scary looking. So Kamchar basically checks this crystal shipment because the Empire are there and they're trying to get more kyber crystals and things. And he opens up a crate and there's barely any in there. And so he basically kills the Imperial who was in charge before him and takes over. Trios comments that she's not intimidated by Kamchar because she says, after you've experienced Vader, no one else is intimidating anymore. But she then says to him that her people have the capabilities to bleed Jeddah for their minerals because that's what their speciality is. And back with the usual gang, you've got Ubin and Chalco are flying the Millennium Falcon, and you've got the gang, so Luke, Leia, and Han, in there with bags over their heads so they can't see where they're going. The, on Jeddah, there's a secret location where the partisans are hiding, and when they sort of get there and things, they're all put on their knees with the bags over their heads, and Luke says that he can sense that the partisans are likely to kill them, and 
The last panel of that comic is you see a guy called Benthic appear, also known as Two Tubes. Now, for clarity, you guys would recognise what he looks like. He is not a human. Okay, so they're kind of humanoid. The species is actually Tognath, and they're from the planet Yar Togna. It's hard to describe how they look. Their nickname is Two Tubes because they have two tubes coming out of their mouth. To help you guys remember, in Rogue One, when the pilot Bodhi gets taken down to Jeddah and he has the bag over his head, he gets the bag ripped off and asks if he's talking to Saul Guerrero. And then there's this being who's got like beige skin, really sunken in eyes, quite an oddly shaped head and tubes coming out of the sort of chin area and is talking in a language which has to have subtitles because you don't understand it. That is two tubes. Now, there's Benthic, and then there's also Edrio. Now, I can't remember which one's which, but essentially both Benthic and Edrio show up in Rogue One. And also, Benthic is actually in Solo, a Star Wars story. He's with Enfys Nest's Cloud Riders towards the end of the film. They have breathing apparatus because they need it to breathe oxygen properly, essentially. And the Empire took over Yar Togna, which is why they're not there anymore. So Benthic has an eggmate called Edrio. I assume eggmate just means like sibling or something similar to that. But Edrio was killed when the events of Rogue One happened. Benthic did survive, and that's who is speaking. So the next comic starts, number 39, and you've got Han Solo is demanding that they take the bags off their heads. He says something to the veil of, if you're going to kill us, just do it. If you're not, can you take the damn bags off our head? You're just wasting time. And they do it. For clarity, Benthic then goes into the details about his eggmate being left behind on Jeddah. And actually, so Edrio, his eggmate, is actually in Star Wars Rebels. He's in Season 4, Episodes 3 and 4, along with Saul Guerrero. So they get talking and things, or the gang and whatnot, and Leia basically says she wants to give supplies to the partisans. They said that they don't want to take orders, and Leia says, look, I don't want to give you any orders, okay? We're just, the rebellion is important, and regardless of how you do it, we just need people on to be able to fight the good fight, essentially. So we'll give you these supplies, we won't give you any orders, you just do you. Leia says that their sister's in pain because, you know, Alderaan was destroyed and Jeddah is severely crippled. And Benthix says that she was very good with words, but also that Saul Guerrero is good with words, but that doesn't make him necessarily a good person. As although they're following by Saul's example, Saul Guerrero actually shot Fletchets at civilians. Now, essentially, a Fletcher, in Legends, there are quite, uh, there's quite a lot of Fletchers in there, but in Canon, there's not really much mention of them. Uh, essentially, the FC-1 Fletcher launcher, it was in the book Rebel Rising, which is kind of like the prequel-ish book to uh, Rogue One. And as I said, in the Clone Wars that are Legends, so not the 3D animated Clone Wars that you see on Disney+, Plus, the 2D animated Clone Wars, where the whole first season is like loads of little five-minute episodes and things, that version of Clone Wars, uh, which was made by, I think, the guy who made Samurai Jack, that has got the Fletchets in there. But once again, that is actually Legends. So it gets mentioned, I think, in Rogue One and lots of places that Saul Guerrero has mentioned. He's an extremist, and he essentially ended up killing a lot of civilians while trying to assassinate someone who's important to the Empire. And he is willing to kill civilians to get a means to end and that's what Benthic mentions to Leia. Ubin and Chalco ask Luke to distribute filters with them because Leia and Benthic go off by themselves to discuss things. Back on the Star Destroyer it is mentioned that Saul Guerrero was stealing a lot of Kyber and in fact Kamchar actually respects Saul Guerrero for his convictions and also the results he got because the amount of Kyber that the Imperials were trying to obtain from Jeddah the amount of that that was actually halted and stolen by Saul Guerrero was an incredibly impressive amount so obviously what Kamcha is saying is that well Saul Guerrero has obviously stolen all this Kyber he probably isn't doing anything with it so we should go down there and get it back he's clearly stored it somewhere so let's get this easier let's just say everyone on Jeddah is a rebel and then we can do with what we want so Luke is with Ubin and Chelko, and they go around this sort of quite abandoned area, but it's quite derelict and things. It's called A Jed, which I think is one of the main towns in Jeddah. They discuss Jyn Erso a little bit from Rogue One, and then the stormtroopers attack with flamethrowers and start burning everything. Luke manages to sort of slink away and then hide and cut through a wall and kind of flank and go behind the stormtroopers. And he sees that they're basically flaming everyone and he goes a bit mental and he kills all of them. He's yelling murderers and swinging his lightsaber about like nobody's business and kills all of them. And he is standing there with a cloak over his head looking quite sinister and he says that he understands. So it goes back up to Trius and Kamchar. They drop this Shooteran equipment. It's basically this big mining thing, and it shoots down to Jeddah. Then Luke gets back to the sort of main base with the partisans and stuff, and he speaks to Benthic and says, look, he understands what's going on. He understands why Saul Guerrero is so extreme in things, because after seeing what the Imperials were doing, just burning people's houses, he gets it. 
and Benthic asks Luke and Han to go and destroy that equipment that Trios and Camtra have sent out. So Luke and Benthic break onto the Imperial equipment while Han is doing something else. Uh, Benthic kills someone, Luke questions it and things, and then they kind of move on because obviously they've got a job to do. They break into the place, they get the shield lowered, and the partisans come and attack while on spammels. Choco gets hit and he falls off his spammel. Then it comes to Han and Leia, they're in the Millennium Falcon and they're getting into position. Then back with Luke and Benthic, and apologies, it keeps flicking back and forth. Luke and Benthic are then, they get this technician who, he was the one who got the shields lowered, and he's completely cooperating with everything that they do, and saying, please don't kill me, I'm not even really part of the Imperials, they just kind of made me come here. And after he's basically been useful enough, Benthic kills the technician. And as he does that, he says to Luke, don't stare. And before Luke can really protest too much, Benthic and Luke leave. After they've left, Han shoots the equipment with the Millennium Falcon, destroys it, and it's called like a Citadel Mine. And they think, yeah, we awesome, we've done this. He then flicks up to Kanchar and Trios, and this Imperial officer goes up to Kanchar and is kind of stuttering and things. And Kanchar's saying, what's wrong with you? Just, just tell me what's happened. You, you think I'm going to kill you if you're a failure? And he puts his arm around this officer and says, look, everyone fails occasionally. You'll need two more failures before I kill you, or one particularly incompetent failure. And then he says to Trios, your people are weaklings, Trios. That mining citadel was overrun in minutes. And then he looks outside and says, oh... That is, and Trio says, our first excursion was a mere prologue, Kamchar. And this shows a cruiser which is called the Leviathan, and it is termed as the Continent Class Crawler, and it is absolutely gigantic. Uh, judging by the size of it, it seems to be almost the size of a Star Destroyer. It's a slightly different shape, so it's kind of hard to tell, but Star Destroyers are one of the biggest ships in Star Wars, um, obviously other than Super Star Destroyers and like Dreadnought Star Destroyers, but the Star Destroyers in general are one of the biggest ships in Star Wars, and this Leviathan, which is a big mining thing, is almost that sort of size. For clarity, I did take a photo of this panel. It's quite a nice double page spread. Uh, and also the other photos I've taken, there's the one of Jeddah being you know, destroyed. And then there's also, I took a photo of when Luke was just after killing all those stormtroopers. So some pretty cool panels in this, these comics. I, I really, really like not only the story, but the artwork of all this. So anyway, it goes back down to the planet and you've got Lucas talking to Chalco, who's obviously probably the closest person who has an understanding of the Force to Luke. And Chalco feels like he's basically lost because he says that when he was riding the Spammel towards the Citadel mine, he should have dodged. He should have felt the Force and moved out the way and not been shot off. Um, Luke comforts him a little bit and then he says, look, I need to do some soul searching. I need some answers and I know a place we can get them. Come with me. So Luke decides to follow Chalco and then Leia stops him questioning his decision and things and she explains to him that look, duty comes first. And then there's this really cool exchange between Bale and Leia. Now I have a note here to read out what Bale and Leia actually said but I'm not going to do that now because what's really interesting is it's the last conversation that Bale Organa and Leia ever had. So it is set Basically, when you last see Bail Organa alive, it is in Rogue One. Uh, he's just spoken to Mon Mothma, and then they talk about how he needs to try and find this Jedi who's going to be able to help them, someone who's a hero of the Clone Wars, and he's speaking about Obi-Wan. And so he sends Leia off on that quest just to go and get Obi-Wan. And then on the way there, you know, everything with Scarif happens and Rogue One and all those sorts of other parts. And then Leia eventually has the Death Star plans on her ship due to everything that happens with Vader at the end of Rogue One. And so that's why she sends off R2 to go and find Obi-Wan because she was meant to go and get him and then take him back to Alderaan so that he could help fight. So the conversation between Bale and Leia is really, really cool, but I'm going to say I'm not, I haven't taken a photo of that, so you guys are going to have to read the comic to find out, or just trust me that it's a cool and interesting conversation. So anyway, um, from that conversation, Leia says, you know, she values duty, and she should do it more so than Luke is a Jedi, and Luke says, no, basically he values being a Jedi above almost all else, and he feels like him being a Jedi will give them the answers they need and bring the solutions, and he feels that's what he should do. So after that, he goes off with Chalco. So they're going nearer the crater. So the crater is where Jeddah City was destroyed. It's basically, yeah, a big hole in the planet. And there's red lightning shooting about everywhere. And Luke mentions that he's uneasy. Uh, the temperature is sort of rising around them. And it's sort of like a force magnet. So while they're on their way there, this giant sand slug attacks them. Now, normally the giant sand slug is actually a herbivore. It's pretty terrifying. It doesn't really look like a slug. It looks like a worm, but if you cut a worm in half and then instead of its insides, it was just loads and loads and loads of teeth, that's what it looks like. Uh, Luke does manage to kill it. It kind of tries to eat him and then it's, he stabs this slug through like the roof of its mouth into his brain. It collapses and Chalco kind of comments saying, this should have been a herbivore. I'm not sure why it attacked us. 
Choco says that the Force moves through them all, and Luke comments that it says it's not the Force that he knows, it's, it feels different and things. And they get towards this edge of this crater, and there's some of these strange sort of people wearing masks and looking kind of strange, and they say, join us in the shadow of death. So that is where that comic ends, so moving on to comic number 41. So Luke and Choco are at this edge of that blast crater, and they're by something called the Temple of the Central Isotoper, and they're speaking to these beings that seem to worship it. Now, these beings, I had to look it up because I didn't recognise them. They are once again in Rogue One. They're sort of background characters and things in Jeddah and whatnot, and I think in one of the visual dictionaries it gives like a, a bit more information about them. They basically say that there's obviously a disturbance in the Force, and Jeddah's only got a few years left of actually being there. And Luke says that this place feels like the worst place in the galaxy. And while he's kind of talking with them and things, it's quite an interesting exchange, and the visuals are amazing. He sees this sort of thing in the distance that looks like a slow meteor, but isn't quite. For clarity, that is that Leviathan thing, that continent-class cruiser. So the Leviathan lands, and then the partisans say they want to destroy it. Han, Leia, and Benthic go and take a look. They sort of scout it. They have a bit of a conversation, and then Benthic says, well, Ubin has already gone there to try and destroy it. She's trying to lay a charge on there. Han says that's ridiculous, because a charge will not do any damage to that giant thing, and she's just trying to basically die for the rebellion like Jyn Erso did. Cuts back to Luke and Chalco, and what these followers of the central isotoper say is that death is the answer to all questions. They tell Luke and Chalco to go and gaze into the abyss and meditate and they'll find the answers that they need. Back to Ubin, she puts the charge on the Leviathan, tries to blow up and it does absolutely nothing because as I said this is like the size of a Star Destroyer and a handheld charge is almost like you know some C4. It doesn't even make a dent or anything. She puts it on sort of the the tracks, the thing that moves it forward and it yeah does nothing. Her speeder then gets shot, and then just before she's about to be killed, Han flies there with Leia. Leia uses a harpoon gun and a tow cable because they are actually flying the T-47 airspeeder. Now, the T-47 airspeeder is, you'd recognize that from Empire Strikes Back. Right at the start, when they're on Hoth, they fly the airspeeders, but the T-47 airspeeder, when they call it the snow speeder, they basically had to modify and put a radiator in there to ensure that the engine cools properly so it doesn't get too hot too cold or anything like that. So they're flying basically the ships at the start of Empire Strikes Back and Leia is the one with the harpoon gun tow cable. She shoots that at Ubin and it grabs Ubin's ship, pulling her out of the way just before the Leviathan would run her over. Han and Leia land the, the airspeeder right near him and I'm going to read out the exchange between Han and Ubin because I think it, it shows the nobility of Han quite a lot and I really like it. Also apologies, I keep saying Han when it's meant to be Han. So he says, Ubin, what are you thinking? And she says, we we have to be able to make sacrifices. Han says, we only give ourselves up when there's no other choice. Get it? You're worth more than throwing yourself away on some fool plan. I'll tell you how we save the galaxy. We don't all die before we save the galaxy. Well, what other options do we have? These are desperate times. We only have such actions. And Leia says, we have a friend coming. When he gets here, well, we may have a suicide mission worth going on. And then it cuts to Chewie. So Chewie is on a ship and he's with a species of Gran, G-R-A-N. Yes, you heard that right. And they're nothing like your grandma. A Gran is basically, you'll have seen them a lot in Star Wars. They're in the prequels quite a lot as well. They look kind of like goats, but they've got three eyes and antenna. Um, also, fun fact, they have two stomachs, so that's cool. There are senators in the prequels who are grand. There's been a pod racer in Phantom Menace who has won. There's been bounty hunters that have been won. They're all over the place, and they've got colonies on Hawk and Malastare. So if you if you saw a grand, even though they've got a really peculiar name, you would definitely recognize them. Basically a orangey goat-faced being with three eyes and small antenna. That's a grand. So Chewie and his grand are on this ship and they've got something special to deliver and they get shot at by a TIE fighter because Jeddah is basically closed. And the engines get quite heavily damaged by this shootout and things. And then it cuts to Luke. Uh, Luke is staring into that abyss with Chalco and he doesn't want to lose himself. So he kind of looks away from it and says, this doesn't feel like the right path for me. If I stand here and stare for too much longer, I feel like I might lose myself and I don't think that's the right thing. While he's sort of saying that, it turns out that Chalco did lose himself. His eyes sort of roll back in his head. He takes his mask off because he's wearing this. It's kind of like a niqab, sort of what a lot of individuals who follow Islam wear. Uh, you basically can't see anything aside from his eyes. And he takes that off and his eyes are sort of rolling back and his speech is quite peculiar. He pulls out a knife and then he just dives at Luke. 
He dives at Luke and Luke falls to the floor with Chalco on top of him and Luke ignites his lightsaber and it ignites right through the middle of Chalco, basically, and then he can push Chalco off. Chalco then says, Luke, I wasn't strong enough. The madness just took me. I took one step and it was a bottomless fall. The dark side here is just too strong. And as he dies, Luke apologizes. And Luke says, I'm just blundering around in the dark. I mean, I'm risking everything and I could end up like Chalco. I have to be patient. I may never be a Jedi and I have to be okay with that. And the central isotopers say, you have learned the only lesson we have to teach. The dark side is perilous. The road that Choco and you were on leads only to madness. Without a true guide, you will fall. We are not them, they are gone. You cannot fall. Too much relies on you. Your friends are in need. And Luke says, I know, I have to listen to Leia. I've risked so much just chasing my personal story when the rebellion needs, and they go, no, Pilgrim, you misunderstand. We mean your friends need you, literally. It cuts back to Chewie, and Chewie is injured because, you know, the ship's been shot a couple times, there's been explosions on the inside, he's got, like, bleeding from his head. He's about to die, the TIE fighter swoops in for its last assault, and Luke flies in and manages to save him. He shoots the TIE fighter, manages to get Chewie, and then they sort of fly back to where they came from. There's this sort of strange, it's like an asteroid ship, I'd call it. It just looks like an asteroid. And then as uh, Luke's ship has gone off into the distance enough, the asteroid engines start up. So it's, yeah, like some sort of weird asteroid ship disguise camo thing. They land on the planet and Chewie delivers something to Leia, which Leia says the shooter runs wouldn't want them to see. And that's where Comic 41 ends. So issue number 42, it starts off with Chewie delivers the Leviathan's readout to Leia and the gang. Uh, Chewie is quite badly injured and Han's quite upset about that, but he, he'll pull through as we all know. And so they have an idea of basically R2-D2 and 3PO are going to get onto the Leviathan and basically turn off the anti-air guns and isolate the bridge from everything else so they can formulate some sort of attack. So Luke and Leia, as well as R2 and 3PO, are in Team 1, who are, as said, going on the ship itself and plugging in and causing all that havoc, while Han and Benthic are on the second team. Before they head out, Luke and Ubin, um, they talk about the chain of events that blown up the Death Star, and Luke talks about how he's not sure he'd even be able to have taken the shot if he'd have known about Jyn Erso and all the Rogue One squadron and things doing what they did because it would have been so much pressure. And Leia says, look, all we do is we do it just for the opportunity that someone can do it. It's, it's hope. So after those conversations and things, it gets to their plan. So Luke and Leia get on board the Leviathan, and while that's all sort of happening and things, it shows what the Imperials are doing on the bridge. It turns out that strange asteroid ship that seemed to follow Luke, they used scanners and things and other known positions and whatnot, and basically located where the Partsons are hiding. So the base gets attacked by the Imperials, and Benthic actually gets shot. He gets pretty badly wounded and is taken onto the Millennium Falcon, and Han manages to get him and escape with a lot of the other Partisans. Back on the Leviathan itself, Leia's protecting R2 and 3PO, and Luke heads to the bridge. So back with Han and the gang sort of on the Millennium Falcon, Ubin is talking about they want to lead and they want to sort of get revenge on people and things. Chewie has some sort of words of Han, and then Han decides that he's going to take over, or rather Chewie convinces him. Han says that he's the captain and basically gets a plan out and says, if you follow me, we may not all die. You know, Ubin was talking about everyone dying in a blaze of glory, that sort of thing. If you follow me, we may be able to survive. And one of the cute things in this comic is that when Han and Chewie have this little back and forth and things, Chewie gives Han a big hug which i really like so back on the leviathan luke goes onto the bridge and while that's happening the falcon lands there's this big shootout and things and han is heavily relying on leia to do up her end of the bargain and leia is in this room with r2 and c3po and queen trios confronts leia at gunpoint and that is where 42 ends so issue number 43, Trios asks Leia to hit her in the face and then Leia does shoot out like a couple of cameras and things and then Trios basically says that she's the one who leaks the plans of the Leviathan to Leia. While that's happening, Commander Kamchar and Luke are fighting. I've taken a photo of part of their sort of fights and things. It's really cool because Kamchar's got this vibro blade part of his cybernetic arm it looks like and he's using that against Luke's lightsaber. Kamchar also mentions that he prefers flamethrowers and is shooting it at Luke instead of shooting blasters, mentioning that he wishes that the clones during Order 66 had flamethrowers because they would have been much more efficient at killing Jedi because it's foolish to shoot blaster bolts at something that can reflect them back at you. While that's happening, Trios is talking to Leia, and Trios says that the Empire doesn't know that the Shoturan have actually stockpiled resources for use. 
Then it goes back to Luke and Kamchar fighting and things. Luke kind of runs away for a bit and Kamchar sort of following him and mocking him. And Luke gets into sort of a hangar and uses an ion torpedo that sets out an ion pulse. It knocks out Kamchar due to a lot of his cybernetics and things. For clarity, an ion pulse it is what was used in the Clone Wars quite a lot. It's something that is specifically targets machines. So Luke manages to escape and then Trios is speaking with Leia. Trio says, look, we'll have an alliance and things, and Leia's all up for that and stuff, and then Luke appears, Luke and Leia leave, and Trios stays to kind of, to keep the deception going with the Empire. The Leviathan is one click away from the hole, which a click is a kilometre, so they're very, very close to that, that big hole, because what their plans are is to drive this Leviathan into the hole that was caused by the Death Star and destroy it so it can't do any more damage. So while that's happening, more Imperials are coming and there's more shootouts and things. And Ubin once again volunteers her life. And Han says, look, you don't need to stay here and to hold down this button just so these guys can escape and things. You don't need to die. I've got a better idea. So he gets Ubin on the Falcon, flies in the air, shoots all the Imperials using the Falcon, grabs the people who are left who were there in the shootout and manages to sort of fly away. When that happens, the Leviathan then falls into the hole and seemingly gets destroyed. It then shows that Trios has escaped with Kamchar on a shuttle, and then it also shows that the Rebellion are all good as well. The Rebels land on Nar Jeddah, and it is shown that Benthic will actually recover. He is still quite badly wounded, but he will guard Jeddah's ashes before moving on, and then once Jeddah's gone, which will apparently be in a couple of years, then he'll move on to go somewhere else. Han speaks to Ubin and gives her a medal, very much like the medal in the medal ceremony in A New Hope, saying that, look, you deserve this, don't throw your life away. And he basically is quite inspiring and whatnot. And as he walks away, he speaks to Leia. And Leia's like, did you just give her your medal? And he's like, oh, no, no, I got loads of fake ones made. Like, if I'm low on credits and things, I'll just sell it to someone, tell them it's that medal from the ceremony, and then no one's the wiser, <laughs> which is quite funny. I have tackled what happens to all of Han's medals and things. It, like the actual medal that Han has, because you know Chewie's given a medal at the end of Rise of Skywalker, um, but also in the comics Chewie is already given a medal, but in the Chewbacca comic he gives it away. So I think if you listen to the Chewbacca comic episode, which I think is episode 22 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, I do actually go into detail of what happens to Luke, Han, and Chewie's respective medals and things. So if you want to know about that, go check that out. And then this comic ends with the trio, along with Chewie and the droids, flying away in the Falcon, which is a really nice way to end it on their next adventure. So yeah, guys, that is basically it. Uh, I really appreciate you guys listening as always. And as I said, I'm going to be putting photos of these many comics on Instagram and on Facebook. I'll put a couple on Twitter, but there is a limit to how many I can put on there. Um, and for clarity as well, you know, you can check out my other show, Genuine Chit Chat. Uh, I've appeared in the show notes. There should be descriptions of all the other shows I've been guesting on recently, including in the Comics and Motion family and outside of the Comics and Motion family on Genuine Chit Chat. Uh, my second part of my chat with the guys from Super Superheroes for Dummies is up. So if you want to hear from Paul and from Dan, the two in air quotes dummies from the Superheroes for Dummies podcast, if you want to hear about them, you know, check out the podcast. It's about two hours long. Um, we just talk about comic books and superheroes, them starting up the podcast. It's quite a cool behind the scenes look at the Superheroes for Dummies podcast as well. And I had loads of fun doing it. In addition to that, as I said, I've guested on quite a few shows. There's a lot of other things sort of coming up in the pipeline. Uh, the 20th Century Geek podcast, myself, Megan and Scott did a Batman retrospective where we tackled relatively all the Batman films, the Dark Knight trilogy, the four Burtonverse films, 66 and Mask of the Phantasm. Uh, part one and part two are out. Part two has been split into two parts. So technically the first three parts are out and the next two parts for Dark Knight trilogy are going to be out soon. But if you follow me on social media, you'll be able to see I post almost every day. I I post about the various podcasts I either guest on or as in, you know, comics for Star Wars Comics and Canon. I post snippets for my Genuine Chit Chat podcast and lots of other things as well. And the last little thing I want to say before going, guys, is I have started up a Patreon for Genuine Chit Chat. Now, essentially on there, you can pay as little as £2 a month, which I think is $3, and you get access to a feed which basically has a whole new show on there called Afterthoughts, where myself and Megan record our thoughts after watching either a movie or a series. So far, I've uploaded us watching The Witcher, series one of that. We then watched the director's cut edition of Watchmen, which is one of my favourite films ever, and Megan really, really didn't like it. So if you want to hear me and Megan have completely opposite views on Watchmen as well, be sure to subscribe to that as well, because as I said on that Patreon feed, the Witcher one is out now, the Watchmen one will be out soon. 
So for clarity, there's the Afterthought series, which I'm going to be trying to do, maybe not every week, but there'll be like a couple of months or so. And also in Genuine Chit Chat, when I split the episodes in two, like I did with the Superheroes for Dummies one, I normally release part one on one week and then part two the following week. I'm still going to do that as standard for Genuine Chit Chat. What I'm also doing is on Patreon, I'm releasing the whole chat in one go. So Patreon has got its own feed as well. So what you'll be able to access on that feed is all of the episodes of Afterthoughts as they come out and things, and also episodes of Genuine Chit Chat when it is a longer two-parter episode, it's just going to be that one full-length thing. So you basically get access to part two a week early. As I said, you can do that for £2 a month, and it means the absolute world to me because podcasting costs me about £25 a month just to keep the lights on, just to host Genuine Chit Chat uh, and also to do Zoom Pro, which is what I use for chatting with people when there's more than one guest. Uh, In addition to that, there's other tiers and things you can take a look at. I've got the Patreon feed, which I'm going to be posting, you know, pictures of my tours, of collectibles, of other things like that as well. I'll do some behind the scenes photos and things of my air quote studio, as well as videos around the flat that we live in. So you can see some of the other collectibles and how I live, which is cool. Uh, in addition to that, there's also things that you can recommend movies and things for me and Megan to watch for the afterthoughts. You can recommend guests. You can come on Genuine Chit Chat as a guest as well. Uh, you get thanks at the end of episodes. You can play promos. There's lots of different things. There's no pressure to anyone listening that has to do any of that sort of stuff as I know a lot of podcasters have got Patreons and in today's climate it is not always easy to just give money to people so it's one of those things where genuine chit chat in itself will not change it's going to be basically the same as it always is part one and part two of longer episodes shorter episodes are still just going to be all released at once but if anyone wants more content from me and Megan talking about TV series movie reviews all that sort of other stuff as well as wanting that part two a week early and being able to listen to a whole conversation that's really long without interrupting then consider checking out my Patreon page. But I really appreciate anyone listening to this podcast as always. I appreciate anyone checking out Genuine Chit Chat, whether or not they're a Patreon. I just appreciate anyone spending their time listening to me talk. It means the world to me. And so if you do like all these things, you know, share on social media about this very show as well as comics in motion share about genuine chit chat tell people about all these things and listen to all the other amazing shows on the podcast feed of comics in motion because they are all incredible and i barely have time to listen to any other podcasts because i'm always listening to the podcasts and comics in motion so as i said guys thank you so much for listening as always and listening to me talk about patreon for so long especially if you got through all of that and yeah i really really appreciate all you guys listening i'll talk to you all next week which is going to be the tie fighter mini series and then the week after that will be continuing the run of afro comics as well hopefully in the background there might be a little interview coming up with another star wars creator but i won't say too much about that quite yet and as always guys may the force be with you